Justin Marceau, a law professor at the University of Denver Stern College of Law, where I specialize in animal law and other civil rights fields. I started in civil rights and human rights work, including in the death penalty and other social justice litigation-related fields, and I came to animal law through law school. I didn't come to law school interested in animal law. It was one of the courses that I took, and I ended up spending my life devoted to the field. A big part of my research today continues to focus on the connection and overlaps between the reasons I went to law school, which were civil rights and animal protection work. I like to explore the way that human suffering and animal suffering are connected. Today, I'm going to talk about one such overlap. That's transparency efforts in the animal law space. This is particularly relevant to me because I grew up in the state of Montana. I grew up around and worked on a fourth generation Montana farm and ranch just outside of the city center of Missoula. The farm is just down the road, a two lane road out of the city. And the farm, like many of the others around it, looks absolutely picturesque. It's the way you would imagine a farm if you were to just sit back and think of what you were seeing. You'd see a small two lane road, red barns, green hills in the shadow of big Montana mountains, and a few cows just dotting the occasional landscape, uh, kind of walking around streams. These images are absolutely beautiful and I remember them well. But the reason I mentioned them is that I didn't think about the animals that I ate until I took animal law. And these images that were part of my childhood have nothing to do with modern agriculture. Over 99% of the animals we raise in this country for food come from factory farms. In contrast to the beautiful scenery of Montana, the factory farm is characterized by its utter lack of beauty and its lack of humanity. Timothy Pascherat wrote a book that he titled Every 12 Seconds, and the title is The Rate at Which We Kill Cows at Industrial Slaughterhouses, One Every 12 Seconds. It's hard to mad imagine manufacturing of anything, shoes or anything, at a rate of one every 12 seconds. But in the slaughterhouse, it's the disassembly of an animal, one per every 12 seconds. And it's brutal and it bears no resemblance to the farm I knew as a kid. And it's this disconnect between the bucolic image of a farm and the reality of factory farming that motivates my talk today. If slaughterhouses had glass walls, we would all become vegetarian. Similarly, an American veterinary science textbook has an introduction that provides that the best thing the American agricultural industry has going for it is that most Americans are several generations removed from the farming operation. In this talk, I'm going to map some of the key developments relevant to law and policy in the area of transparency. I'm gonna talk first about the social science behind investigations and transparency. Second, I'm going to discuss meat libel laws and some of the cases that arise under those laws. And then finally, I will discuss a set of anti-transparency laws that have commonly come to be known as ag-gag laws. And I'll look at the litigation around those. And finally, I'll offer some concluding thoughts. In thinking about transparency, it's generally assumed that more information is better. But in this section, I wanna talk about what kind of information should we be providing? Are there certain sources of information that the public trusts more than others? So starting with the kinds of information that might be relevant. First, and perhaps most importantly, the public cares about the mistreatment of animals. It seems that evidence relating to animal mistreatment is always relevant and the sort of thing we might direct transparency towards. Polls have consistently found overwhelming majorities of Americans tend to want animals to be treated well. The most recent Gallup poll found close to 90% of Americans think that animals deserve protection from harm. So presenting evidence of mistreatment, things like poor conditions and the like, can be a very important part of transparency when we're thinking about law reform. This could be focused on a puppy mill, it could be a research lab, it could be a factory farm, could be any number of animal industrial opportunities. But the point is we're looking for some sort of mistreatment. Of course, what counts as mistreatment and whether all animal mistreatment is the same is a different question. But the recent Smithfield trial suggests that we're not just talking about dogs and cats. In fact, the trial tends to suggest 
that even when it comes to farmed animals like pigs, the public has a soft spot when it comes to transparency revealing bad conditions for animals. The Smithfield trial that I just mentioned is an example from just 2022 this year, and it involves Paul Darwin Picklesheimer and Wayne Shung. These two are activists for direct action everywhere, and they stood trial in rural Utah for offenses including burglary and theft relating to their entry of one of the largest factory farms in the United States, a Smithfield pig farm. The farm is about 20 miles long, and it's filled with barn after barn after barn for 20 miles, each barn containing tens of thousands of pigs. And Paul and Wayne entered the farm in order to look at whether Smithfield had been keeping good on its promise to phase out so-called gestation crates. These are tiny crates so small that the animal kept inside of them cannot turn around. But when they entered to take pictures and video of these facilities, they found not only gestation crates, but a number of sick and dying baby piglets. And Paul and Wayne removed two of these piglets, Lily and Lizzie, and in doing so, brought upon themselves the wrath of criminal charges. Now, the farm didn't even know that the pigs had been taken until the story appeared in the New York Times some weeks later. But the point here is that ultimately, both Paul and Wayne were acquitted of charges for which there was video evidence that they took showing themselves removing pigs. So how could they be acquitted? This is a lesson, perhaps, a case study, you might say, in how bad conditions on a factory farm impact the public's opinion of what is necessary or what's appropriate or even what is legal. So I think conditions matter a lot when we're thinking about transparency. But another thing that matters are human-like characteristics of the animal. For example, the intelligence of the animal. A number of studies have consistently found that people are very interested in how intelligent an animal is. Can it identify itself? Can it count? Can it play a video game? The more intelligent an animal is, the higher the public places the animal on the moral status ladder. And likewise, the more they are likely to say that it deserves protection under the law. Similarly, researchers have tended to find that things like warmth and competence, that is, how how loving do we perceive the animal to be or how good at the things it does, is it particularly strong or particularly fast, might be treated as morally relevant. So perhaps investigations that look at things like intelligence or warmth or competence would be particularly helpful for people. The point here, of course, is we want to be exposing people to things that might produce change. We're not just doing investigations or exposing things or creating transparency for the sake of transparency. But the problem is that not everyone is going to look at these investigations. There's a bit of a ignorance is bliss type syndrome here, because in fact, the less you know, the less, ex the less you're exposed, the less dissonance you are going to experience. And this means that people might not read articles. They might deliberately refuse to engage with material that will trigger dissonance about their eating or other habits relating to animal agriculture. And in this sense, we might produce glass walls, but if everyone was looking in the other direction, it's not going to matter very much. There's another and related problem, which is that the research tends to show that persons might care about facts like intelligence only up until it becomes personally relevant. And this is also a concern for transparency. I won't go into it in too much detail here, but the short version is that the American public, uh, and actually the public all across the world that have been polled on these issues, tend to find things like intelligence relevant, but they only do so up until the point that it becomes relevant to what they're already eating. So if they find information about the intelligence of an animal that they're not eating, that would be highly relevant to how they assess its entitlement to legal protection or its moral status. But if it's an animal they already eat, we tend to find no variation between their moral valuation um, when it goes from high to low intelligence. So in this sense, sort of wrap that piece up, investigations may be more or less effective depending on what they reveal. It doesn't mean that the transparency is pointless, but it does mean that for many people, 
raw facts alone aren't going to change their orientation. And this is consistent with a broader body of research in journalism and law, finding that in order for change to happen, you need both facts and you also need some sort of political movement that uses those facts. You can't just sort of throw the facts out into the ether and hope that they will change the world. The other type of social science information that I think is relevant and helpful to focus on here is the sources of information. Because we're not going to get this information through tours. Large factory farms generally aren't providing tours. And so what tends to happen is that there are investigations. And this could mean a variety of things, of course. It could mean FOIA document requests relating to public parts of the, the farm. It could mean um, financial records and land records, county records, um, all variety of investigative journalism methods. But it could also require true undercover investigations. And by undercover investigation, I mean something secretive. I mean an effort to obtain information that is not otherwise available and to obtain this information in ways that might at first seem ethically dubious. For example, by lying or by engaging in recording without consent. And so my question uh, is, well, are some investigations better than others? Are some investigative techniques um, particularly disfavored? Or do we dislike an investigation if it's not done by a professional journalist? Things like this. And along with my co-author, Alan Chen, I have a book coming out with Cambridge University Press called Transparency and Truth. And we did a lot of research on these questions in social science, had great nationally representative samples, controlled for all variety of things, including gender, race, political balance, economics, education. And what we found were a number of things that are relevant to thinking about transparency in this area of law and policy. First, and perhaps most importantly, we were able to show that the vast majority of Americans have a high baseline level of support for undercover investigations. There's a lot more support for undercover investigations than we had imagined, even as experts in the field. Um, the public supports investigations in ways that are quite surprising. This is not some sort of political third rail. It has broad bipartisan support, uh, these efforts to expose um, politically controversial topics. We also show that the country is not as politically divided on the issue in some important ways relating to a hypothesis we had, which was that we imagined that persons would be less interested in investigations if they were done by a news entity that was contrary to their own political orientation. So for example, we imagined that Democrats would be less interested in undercover investigations if they were done by Fox News. But contrary to our hypothesis, we found that there's not such a political bifurcation, and in fact, Liberals still think highly of undercover investigations done by Fox News, and persons who identify as conservative tend to have a lot of trust in investigations done by entities like the New York Times. We also show that investigations transcend politics in another way, and that is that persons on all sides of the political spectrum tend to support investigations, even when they reveal wrongdoing of persons or groups they tend to support. Right? The only notable difference, the only, we, we, we looked at a number of different investigations. We looked at investigations in dogfighting and political corruption in healthcare and a bunch of different areas. And the only way, place where we located any statistically significant difference between Democrats and Republicans was that Republicans were slightly less interested in undercover investigations of factory farms, which is obviously quite relevant to this topic. But by and large, there is bipartisan support for undercover investigations. And the only statistically significant difference we found related to factory farms. And lastly, we show that even if undercover investigations are motivated by political fame or profit, contrary to prior research, we're able to show that the public does not discredit this investigation simply because it was done for those reasons. So that means that even if a group like PETA has sort of an infamous public reputation does an investigation, that doesn't mean the public discounts it. In fact, public opinion of investigations really doesn't vary depending on who is investigated or who does the investigating. So where does this all leave us when it comes to investigations? I think we can start with the proposition that transparency is important. It's important to the public. It's not a silver bullet and not all information is equal, but the information is important. 
And the fact that information comes from the political left or the political right or from activists or professional journalists doesn't make quite the difference we would have assumed. The simple fact is transparency is going to help shape law and we should care about it. No discussion of transparency around animal agriculture would be complete without a look at meat libel laws. Whereas ag-gag laws, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, focus on what can be learned about the industry on the front end, sort of what can be done on the front end to gather information about the industry, these libel laws work on the back end to limit what can be said, what can be said about industry in this field. Of course, free speech in the United States has a long and storied history. It's often mythologized as one of the most important principles in our country. And so this idea that you could target for protection a particular industry is rather striking. In our country, where free speech is protected, it's hard to imagine that we would tolerate laws that say you can't criticize Joe Biden or you can't criticize Wells Fargo or that you can't criticize a particular industry. And yet a version of that is exactly what is accomplished by the meat libel laws, which do provide protection from criticism for agricultural industry. To be precise, meat libel is a type of libel or defamation law more generally. And defamation or libel is an exception to speech in the sense that if you cause harm to someone and you do so while knowing that what you're saying is false, then you could be civilly liable. That is to say, you can't just injure someone's reputation with false information. What meat libel laws do is they simply take that principle and expand it. They expand it by making it easier for farmers to file defamation or libel type cases against persons who are critical of their products. So it's an expansion of defamation liability for one particular industry. Now, the contours of these laws vary, but the basic gist is pretty simple and consistent. They tend to have the effect of deterring or chilling speech that is negative, never favorable. There are no penalties for speaking favorably about a delicious meat slab or some dairy product. It's only penalties if you're saying something critical of an agricultural product. So what this means is that persons become afraid to say things that are opinion or afraid to say things that they aren't sure about when they are critical of an agricultural production facility. For example, in some jurisdictions, if you say something critical about the industry, you will actually be presumed to have spoken untruthfully about that industry. By contrast, traditional defamation and disparagement law requires that the person bringing the case and saying, hey, you hurt my reputation, has to prove that what you said about their reputation or what you said about them is false. So the burden of proof here is essentially flipped, and that makes all the difference. Because if you take, for example, something like paint, if I was to criticize um, a paint, like lead paint, and say, I think this is dangerous to children, then if the paint producer wants to come after me and say that what I said was harming their business, they would need to prove that their paint product is safe. If I say that an electric vehicle is dangerous, if that is harming the industry, the electric vehicles can sue me, but they would need to show that their vehicle is not dangerous. Right? By contrast, if I say that I think meat is dangerous or carcinogenic or something else, then in some jurisdictions, I can be sued unless I can prove, and in some jurisdictions it requires with reasonable science, that what I said is true. This is a huge difference, right? In many cases, it's the difference that will, that will carry the day in court. You can imagine that if as a speaker, I'm not certain about my facts, then I'm probably going to sit there quiet. I would be chilled from talking negatively about meat products or agricultural products more generally. Now, again, there's lots of variations on the laws. There's punitive damages in some states and not others. But suffice to say, this is a form of libel or disparagement law that is favorable to one particular industry. 
Now, there's good reason to think that favoring a particular type of speech or a particular type of industry's speech would be unconstitutional, yet they remain on the books. These laws are still there, and I'll talk about two recent examples of litigation under these laws. A first example arises in Texas uh, and involves Oprah Winfrey, and it was described by one local paper as the time when Oprah Winfrey beefed with the cattle industry. The case arose out of a 1996 segment of the Oprah Winfrey show about mad cow disease. One of Oprah's guests, a whistleblower and former rancher, talked about his fears about the mad cow disease in the United States and the potential for a pandemic. The comment and some others from Winfrey's show were blamed, at least in part, for drops in U.S. beef prices. And the Texas cattlemen sued Winfrey. They sued her under the meat libel law and said that by allowing someone to worry about a pandemic, she was damaging their bottom line and they were therefore entitled to damages. But Winfrey wouldn't settle the case. And in fact, she relocated her and her entire show to Amarillo, Texas for a six-week trial. So this pitted one of the largest employers in the area against a national celebrity. Winfrey ultimately prevailed, but it was very close. And there's no way that the average person could have, A, even defended themselves in court and hired the lawyers to do so. This wasn't a case where lawyers were appointed. Or B, had the wherewithal to avoid settling a case when it was a $10 million plus uh, lawsuit. So the Winfrey case is in some ways a warning shot because she did escape without liability and was able to move herself there for six weeks. But other more recent cases show that not everyone is going to escape unscathed. And a second case I wanna mention arises in South Dakota. And it's the case against ABC for using the term, quote, pink slime. They used the term pink slime to describe a substance that the industry wants to have called finely textured lean ground beef. It's a substance that in packaging and in the press has been called, quote, fresh ground beef. The product, in fact, is a highly processed, pulverized meat product that is ultimately treated with ammonia. It's kind of the end process of meat production. It's not big cuts. It's little chunks of tendon and meat and whatever that have stuck to the bone. And they spin them around in large vats of centrifugal force, pull it off, and then whatever remains, they treat with chemical and stir around. And then, as I said, market it as fresh ground beef. ABC provided a series of reports that did nothing other than describe this product as pink and as slimy. No one really thinks that what they said was untrue, much less maliciously untrue. Nonetheless, with a literal home court advantage and the ability to have a trial judge from South Dakota and a jury impaneled from a plant that was downsizing, ABC was sued under the state's meat libel law for calling this pink slime. Now, food-related information is undoubtedly a matter of public concern, and ABC was reporting on information that was provided to it by reliable sources. Again, there was nothing here that suggested it was untrue. And so in many ways, this is a case of classic journalism, reporting on matters of public concern, doing so with reliable sources. But the state trial judge, to the great disbelief of First Amendment lawyers across the country, refused to dismiss the case. They denied motions to dismiss the case on free speech grounds and said that it would go to trial. And if there were free speech issues, they could appeal. But as lawyers for ABC understood, going to trial in South Dakota meant the prospect of bankrupting liability for one of the largest broadcasters in the country. They literally could have been bankrupted if a jury found them liable under a statute. And their best defense was free speech, which the judge refused to permit. So ultimately, ABC, through its counsel, settled the case for around $177 million. 
a sum of money that was larger than any defamation verdict in the U.S. at that point. In a political moment where lots of people are talking about cancel culture, we should be on heightened alert to the fact that there are laws in many states that literally allowed one of the largest, most powerful broadcasting companies in the country to be shut down, to take down their message, simply because an agricultural production facility didn't like it. Not because it was demonstrably untrue. Think about that. One of the largest broadcasting companies in the world can be pushed to the brink of financial ruin for running a segment that it honestly and reasonably believed to be true. It's in the face of little resistance or even some success, as cases like this illustrate, under these agricultural disparagement statutes, that states have then taken the next step, the next big leap, and they've criminalized access to information about agricultural sites. And that's why I'm going to talk about ag-gag laws next. So what are ag-gag laws? In simple terms, they are laws that gag or cut off whistleblowing about the agricultural field. More specifically, they are laws that criminalize or otherwise prohibit undercover investigations targeting agricultural facilities. The term was first coined by New York Times writer Mark Bittman. Bittman was covering an undercover investigation done by Mercy for Animals. Mercy for Animals went undercover at a Texas ranch. And what they had revealed was a series of terrible events. First, a storm blew into Texas on a farm where there was no shelter for the newly born baby cows. After the storm, the cows were so cold, many of them hypothermic, that they couldn't stand. What the investigator captured next was the fact that the owner of the farm deemed the baby cows unprofitable and ordered the workers to kill them, and to kill them with axes, hammers, and shovels. It was a grotesque image of innocent baby animals being killed with blunt force trauma. It's a bloody video. But Bittman reminds us, as his readers, that the reason he wrote the story was because around this time, in the early 2012s, ag-gag laws were actually being introduced in states across the country. And what these laws were doing, again, was making it a crime to conduct an investigation like the one that Bittman was reporting on. They were making a crime of investigators like those at Mercy for Animals. There's an old saying, don't shoot the messenger. And I like to think of ag-gag laws as the legal manifestation of the opposite of this principle. It is blaming and criminalizing those who are bringing you the bad news about where your food comes from. Ag-gag laws literally codify the practice of shooting the messenger by allowing investigators to be thrown in jail for nothing more than investigating. Their only crime is the act of documenting what is happening in industrial settings. And indeed, this isn't really a controversial point. The legislative history for these laws makes absolutely clear what was going on. In my paper, I document this in some detail, but I'll give you a couple of highlights. The ag-gag law in Idaho, for example, emerged after a very successful investigation of a large Idaho dairy. Following that investigation, there were boycotts and even some national protests that led to corporate campaigns and led to corporations questioning whether they wanted to continue to take product from this Idaho dairy. In response, state lawmakers introduced Idaho's ag-gag law. They were not cagey about the fact that they were doing so because animal rights activists had targeted an Idaho business. One of the drafters of the law said that the law was necessary in order to keep animal rights people off of their, quote, soapbox. 
So the drafters and the sponsors of this legislation were using the very metaphor of political speech to explain and justify why they would introduce this law in Idaho. Again, the point is very clear. They did not want an investigation that showed things that were so upsetting that boycotts and protests followed. Another lawmaker was equally transparent, and she explained that to her, egg-egg laws would not have been necessary if the organizers of the investigations hadn't led to boycotts or if they had not contributed to protests. She said this was what crossed the line for her. It was when the activists started wanting things like protests, things like boycotts. But of course, this lays it all bare because the point of an egg-egg law then is to deter the rise of a social movement around animal protection. On the one hand, I want to be shocked that the animal industrial complex is transparent about its motives, that they hate transparency so much. But on the other hand, this is exactly the glass walls thesis, the idea that if we know more, it is bad for industry. And egg-egg laws are, in a nutshell, a legal codification of the idea that glass walls would always be legally impossible. Although the history and the purpose of these laws, as I've already set out, is quite similar. They had a similar design, a similar purpose. There are some differences. And I'm going to touch on three types of ag-gag laws in this discussion. Although in the paper, I go through several others and also talk about ag-gag laws in other jurisdictions, including Canada and Australia. But for today, let me just highlight the three types of ag-gag laws that I'm going to cover. First, there are laws that prohibit audio or video recording without consent. Second, there are laws prohibiting deception used to gain access or gain entry. And then third are what I will call quick reporting ag-gag laws. The first category of ag-gag law are those laws that prohibit recording of an agricultural facility without the express consent of the owner of the facility. And the key thing to realize about these laws and these provisions is that they aren't seeking to punish trespass. They aren't seeking to get people into jail who are sneaking on at night with masks or otherwise sneaking onto the property. There's already trespass to do that. They aren't targeting people who are breaking into facilities and stealing animals. There's already laws that do that. The only question here is whether they can criminalize someone for turning on their recording device when they're otherwise lawfully present. So if you are lawfully present at a political rally, can it be made a crime to turn on your camera and record it? If you're lawfully on the sidewalk, can it be made a crime to turn on the recording? No one is saying that there is a right to access because you want to record. The question in these cases was always about is it okay to prohibit someone from recording when they are otherwise lawfully present? And two of the states that had litigation specifically touching on this issue were Utah and Idaho. The laws barring recording in both of those jurisdictions were struck down in a major defeat for the agricultural industry. But more generally, it was the case that the animal industry lost and the animal rights groups won a victory for civil rights more generally. This was an instance where animal lawyers became the vanguard for pushing free speech and civil rights issues more generally. Now, it's much more common for courts to recognize that there is a right to record. There is a right to record in public. When the public see um, a video of a police um, uh, excessive force case or some sort of unlawful arrest, it's no longer surprising to see the video, not only because we know that many people have cell phones with recording devices, but also because legal developments in cases like egg-egg laws protected the right to record in public. So it's not something that was, was established prior to many of these cases. But of course, the right to record in public doesn't obviously or necessarily translate to a right to record in private. Well, that's where the litigation of ag-gag laws goes one step further, and groups like PETA and ALDF led this litigation and led to uh, favorable precedent. 
I'll explain briefly how the litigation on these cases proceeded. Um, and I'll do so by, by use of some simple examples. The way that it was conceived of as understanding the right to record in public as translating to a right to record uh, in private is really pretty straightforward. As I already said, it wasn't an argument that you got to go somewhere you didn't otherwise get to be. You don't get to go into a prison because you want to make a video about prisons. It's if you're already in prison, could you record? It's not that I have an unassailable right to record. It's just, do I have a right to record when I'm present? So if I have a right to record in public or outside, then it's pretty clear that I have a right to record my cat and make a cat video outside. The question then becomes, well, could the state prohibit me from making a cat video in a studio or in my house? It would seem absurd, but the speech, of course, hasn't changed at all. The speech is exactly the same. The speech is the recording of the cat. So it's all a question of whether that is, in fact, speech. And the courts held that it was. It's also the case that you could imagine the recording in public versus private divide coming down to spaces where the public is often invited. For example, could the state pass a law saying you can't record anything that is happening in Walmart, whether it's labor protests or shopping? Could the state prohibit recording in your favorite restaurant? So when you enter a restaurant to eat, you'd be prohibited from any recording or audiovisual um, use. No pictures, no video, no audio recording. On the one hand, that would seem really surprising. What if you wanted to record the fact that your dinner companion was being arrested? If you could re record it on the street, why not in the restaurant? Or you wanted to take a picture of your dish, right? Um, surely food critics would be upset. But the idea here was never that ag gags laws wanted to target everything or that they wanted to make it just categorically impossible to record inside. Instead, they were targeting only certain facilities, those that produce animal products, and only targeting those facilities of criticism. If you were making a video that was a puff piece celebrating how great it was to be a cow in a slaughterhouse, you would never be in trouble. It was only videos that were going to convey the agricultural industry in a negative light. By the logic that we have applied when thinking about litigation in the ag-gag context, when someone is lawfully present within an agricultural facility, the groups challenging these laws have secured notable victories in getting courts to recognize that the people can't just be turned into criminals for turning on a recording device. You're not innocent if you're not taking notes or not recording and guilty as soon as you start to do so. Just like Upton Sinclair was allowed to use his notepad, the modern day journalist is allowed to record. You are not a criminal simply because you turned on your recording device. Whether you're on a tour or whether you're working as an employee or whether you're just passing through. The act of recording does not separate crime from non-crime. And in a critical victory making exactly this point, the Federal Court of Appeals in the Ninth Circuit, striking down Idaho's ag-gag provision on this point, said, quote, we easily dispose of Idaho's claim that the act of creating an audiovisual recording is not free speech protected by the First Amendment. This argument is akin to saying that even though a book is protected by the First Amendment, the process of writing the book is not. Audiovisual recordings are protected by the First Amendment. And this is critical, right? What ag-gag laws are about is saying, oh, this isn't speech, it's just recording. But of course, everyone recognizes that creating videos are part of the speech process of watching and showing videos. The second category of ag-gag laws are those that target deception. These laws are in some ways better understood or more persuasive to the public because they have kind of a moral angle and a privacy angle, both of which are understandable. It's not ethical to lie. Most of us try to avoid lies whenever we can, and nobody wants someone spying on them. So the idea of retaining privacy also resonates with the public. And in this sense, it's become popular to describe access gained by deception as really ethically dubious and an intrusion into our, our sort of sacred private property and privacy rights. But again, we don't learn things about baby cows getting hit with pickaxes because of public tours. We learned about it because of deception. We didn't learn about mother cows being separated from their babies in really brutal conditions 
because of a public tour. We learned about it because of an undercover investigation by animal justice. And we didn't have the largest beef recall in U.S. history uh, because there was um, a press release by the beef industry. We learned about it because there was an undercover investigation based on deception. So lies are an interesting, if somewhat ethically questionable way of exposing what is happening in these large and dark and not open to the public facilities. It's a sort of means to the end, and you can question the ethicality of it, but at the end of the day, we would not know nearly as much as we do about the factory farming industry uh, if there were no deceptions. When it comes to the law in this area, protection for lies is sort of interesting. It had long been assumed that protecting lies was not really the job of free speech. Why? Because free speech was viewed as this marketplace of ideas, where you put in good ideas and they would compete with each other. And in that sense, Lies are always bad. They're distracting. They're not true. They're not adding anything to the marketplace of value. They're only taking away and obscuring. But on the other hand, and the, the argument that ultimately prevailed is the idea that if lying is a crime, then some of us are going to be chilled from saying things that we're not sure if they're true or chilled from saying things that are controversial for fear that we'll be accused of lying. And we're not sure who's going to be the ultimate arbiter of truth. Some government official is going to decide what we said was true or false, uh, and this seems problematic. And it was on this basis that in 2012, the U.S. Supreme Court took up a case about lying, and it was called U.S. versus Alvarez. The Alvarez case involved a man who was lying, presumably to help him resecure an election for a small local government position, he was lying about having won the Medal of Honor. So truly the most worthless lie, a lie that was just designed to help his image, to help his own image in his mind and perhaps self-aggrandizement with his constituents. Even in this context, the context of a truly worthless lie that has no value to the marketplace of ideas, the Supreme Court, I would say correctly, recognized that this was speech, it was speech because if we did not protect it, then someone giving a political speech in the future might be afraid of what they say. We don't want opponents to be able to press charges against their political enemy simply because they misstated something, right? And so um, for the most part, it is now the case that lies are a protected canon of speech. But there are categories of lies that are not protected. And the most notable are lies that cause direct harm or injury. This means fraud is still a crime. The telemarketer who's trying to steal your financial information is still guilty. Right? But the question, and the hard question that's going to continue uh, well beyond the, the scope of this paper, is whether and in what circumstances um, lies do cause harm. Right? We can be pretty sure that saying, I love political candidate X in order to get invited to their political fundraiser is not the sort of lie that causes harm. But what about a lie that is, I think your kid is so beautiful. Do you mind if I come over for dinner? You're trying to curry favor and you don't think the kid is cute at all. Probably not a lie that causes harm. Um, we don't know the exact lines, but what I can tell you is that a number of states have targeted lies broadly in this category and said any deception told in order to gain access to an agricultural facility will be criminalized. So again, we're not talking about lies here of a nature of I'm good with animals or I'm a veterinarian or I have experience with heavy equipment. We're talking about lies of the sort that help an investigator gain access, a lie about whether they are a journalist, a lie about whether they work for PETA, right? Um, and again, they're not trying to gain access to a bedroom. They're not trying to gain access to someone's home. The lies are limited to gaining access to a commercial facility to learn details about this highly regulated industry. So states themselves have passed two types of deception egg egg laws. The first is a generic lie or omission prohibition. Any lie or omission you make in order to gain access would be criminal. Um, and I'll tell you that the courts have split on this point. Um, a federal court of appeals reviewing an Idaho law 
that did just that said that such a provision was unconstitutional. But recently in Iowa, Federal Court of Appeals, and a Federal Court of Appeals sitting in Iowa in the Eighth Circuit went the other direction. So we have a circuit split on that point. Another type of deception would be the type of law that might be used to gain employment. And again, I don't want to get into all of the ethical issues that some people have with that, but the basic gist is this is exactly what Upton Sinclair was doing, coming out and gaining employment, doing the work. No one is saying that somebody should go be a danger on the job or take a job that they can't do or not do the job. The, the wages they're being paid are for work that should, and, and as I understand it, always are done by the investigators. The question is whether they can conceal their identity. Can they refuse to say that they're a reporter for the New York Times? Can they refuse to say that they work for Mercy for Animals, as in the example of the Texas investigation that Mark Bittman covered? What kind of lies for employment are tolerable. Here too, we've seen a number of jurisdictions target these things, including Idaho and Iowa and Kansas. And the short take for our, these purposes is that courts have been relatively hostile to these laws, but not overwhelmingly so. And there are instances, including in Idaho, where a federal court of appeals upheld, at least in part, a narrow provision that criminalized efforts to gain employment for employment-based investigations. So this story continues to unfold, and it's going to, not going to be answered just by investigations in the animal context. We're going to learn a lot about the scope of protections for undercover investigations, as with many things in animal law, by how the law develops in other fields, including investigations of uh, abortion facilities, investigations of prisons. Um, these, the law here will develop over time. I want to mention, though, the third and final type of ag gag law, and these are what I have called quick reporting laws. These are the laws that criminalize investigators who fail to report any abusive behavior within a short period of time, maybe 24 hours or 48 hours. And there's only one such law in the country. It's Missouri. And what Missouri's law does, in the eyes of many, is not very controversial, right? Requiring that people report animal abuse is generally something you would imagine that those who care about animals would support. But there's a problem with this law, not surprisingly, because it was motivated by the same goals as the other ones I mentioned. Industry has no problem replacing the workers in factory farms. In fact, some of these facilities have 100% turnover of employees every year. So, Losing an employee to an investigation is not a big deal. If an investigation comes out and the employer can say, oh my gosh, we really dislike that guy, he has to be fired, it's not a big cost to the employer who's probably expecting 100% turnover. But if an investigation is allowed to go on for weeks or months, there's a much greater risk that there would be corporate liability or managerial liability. What would happen is the possibility that managers see or the managers sign off on, or that the corporation is complicit in the abuse that's captured on a first day or a second day. But that takes time to establish that evidence. And quick report laws cynically make that absolutely impossible because they require the first sign of any animal abuse, the investigator then has to turn over their footage and go to the police or the prosecutors. So a quick report law sounds good. The ultimate effect is to force all of the criminal charges on the workers, and to avoid any exposure for the company. Now, to date, the litigation challenging these ag egg laws has been very successful. Laws or portions of laws in Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, Iowa on multiple different occasions, and Kansas have all been struck down, among others. This is a tremendous victory for the animal protection movement. This is a Victory that has been celebrated by civil rights organizations, including the ACLU and others around the country. And it does provide some hope for a glass walls and truth orientation about factory farms. Still, the future of transparency efforts is widely unknown, in part because, as I mentioned, there are cases that are still pending and investigations in other contexts might well dictate the precedent that applies here. Earlier this year, in fact, speaking about investigations by the Center for Medical Progress, which looks at um, abortion-providing facilities, 
The Washington Post ran a story written by its media critic that was highly critical of undercover investigations that used deceptions, casting doubt on whether the American public will continue to view them as viable and permissible. For the moment, states continue to look at new ways to insulate factory farms from scrutiny. And in some jurisdictions, prosecutors have even started pressing charges against investigators when there is no ag gag law on the books. So even as there remain doubts about whether glass walls really make the world vegetarian or even much better at a rapid rate, what we can't doubt is that industry is absolutely committed to keeping these facilities secret, to keeping them closed off from public access and to transparency. The animal industrial complex has made keeping their practices a secret a top priority. And the way I think of it is that transparency may not be a silver bullet, but it is a necessary part of the efforts to combat factory farming. Factual information is going to be key to persuading lawmakers to make changes on behalf of animals. I'll end here with a quote from Hannah Arendt's essay, Truth and Politics from 1967, which I think drives home the point that the debates about factory farming have often been about disagreements of opinion, but the undercover investigations reveal something that is unquestionably true about the industry. The quote is, unwelcome opinion can be argued with, rejected, or compromised upon, but unwelcome facts possess an infuriating stubbornness that nothing can move except plain lies. What undercover investigations do is force the animal industrial industry into the corner with nothing left but plain lies. For the Brooks Institute, I'm Justin Marceau.